This video tutorial is part of our Mastering QPCR Online course. For more information, visit courses.toptipbio.com or visit the link in the description. So when it comes to designing QPCR primer pairs, there are some features that you should look out for to create the best primer pairs. And what I'll do is I'll go through each one and give you an example of each. The first being is PCR product size. This would be the product size after the PCR has been performed. Now ideally for QPCR you want to keep the PCR product size between 70 and 200 base pairs. Anything larger than this is likely to have a low primer efficiency. So overall what you don't want to do is create something too small or too large. So just about right. I try and aim for about 150 base pair if I can. The next feature of a good primer pair is the primer length should be between 18 and 22 base pairs long. So ideally you want them to be 20 base pairs. So again, you don't want them too short or too long. You just want them just about right. The next aspect of a good PCR primer pair is the TM. So this TM stands for melting temperature. So the melting temperature of each primer should be between 59 and 65 degrees. Ideally around 62 degrees is the optimal that you should aim for. So what is the melting temperature of a primer? The melting temperature is when half of the primer has become dissociated and become single stranded. Another thing to note is that each primer in your primer pair should have roughly the same TM. You want them to be within one degree of each other. So the reason why you would design around 62 degrees TMs for your primers is that when you come when it comes to selecting an annealing temperature for QPCR, generally the annealing temperature is two to five degrees lower than the TM of your primer pairs. By aiming for a 62 degree TM for your primers, you should then, when it comes to QPCR, anticipate that the annealing temperature is around 58 to 60 degrees. But obviously the best thing to do is to optimize your primers when you first get them and perform a PCR gradient. The next aspect is the GC content of your primers. So the GC content is essentially what it says on the tin. It's the amount of GC bases you've got in your primers. And you want these to be within 50 to 60%. And again, you want each primer in the primer pair to have roughly the same GC content. So why is the GC content important? When you have a high amount of GCs, this generally means that the TM, the melting temperature will be higher and the annealing temperature will be higher. And this is because the hydrogen bonds between G and C bases is three hydrogen bonds, as opposed to two hydrogen bonds between A and T bases. So when you have a high amount of GCs in your primers, this can actually cause complications further down the line. So aim between 50 and 60% if you can. Another aspect of a good QPCR primer pair is what is known as having a GC clamp. As we mentioned previously, GC binding is a lot stronger than AT binding. So a GC clamp is when you have at least one G or C base in the last five bases of your primer. So I'll give you an example. Say this is a sequence of a primer. If you look at the last five bases, you can see that this primer does contain a GC clamp because there is a G as well as a C in the last five bases. It doesn't matter whether it is GC or it could just be one C. The reason why a GC clamp is useful is that it ensures that the primer binds completely onto the template. The next feature is to avoid any repeats in sequences in your primer. This is quite an obvious one. So I'll give you an example of three primers here. And the one at the top and the bottom contain repeats of A's and T's respectively. So you want to avoid this. So just be wary when you're looking at the sequence itself and just identify if you can see any repeats because this is generally not good. The next aspect is something that I think is the most important feature of a good primer pair is I like to design my primer pairs to be separated by at least one intron. Say we have a gene here and it contains four exons and it also contains three introns in orange. So if we say we had primers that bound one bound to exon one and one bound to exon three, the messenger RNA doesn't contain any introns. So the introns between exons one and two, as well as the intron between two and three, 
would be removed by splicing. So what you would end up is an amplification that looks like this. You would have a PCR product that would span exon 1 and exon 3. Whereas, say if you did have some DNA in your sample, since DNA contains exons and introns, what would happen is the introns would get amplified and you'd notice that the PCR product size would become larger. Now depending on the intron that's in between these exons, this PCR product size could be in the thousands of base pairs. So the good thing is to have your primers bind onto one exon and then another primer to bind on a different exon. Now this limits the chance of genomic DNA amplification during PCR. Other people also like to do what is known as an exon-exon span, where your primer binds over two exons instead of completely binding onto one. So these attributes are trying to limit the chance of genomic DNA amplification. Another aspect is linking back to the primers for reverse transcription. What you want to do if, if you selected oligo-DTs during reverse transcription, to design your primer pairs near the free end of the gene, or if you're using random hexmers near the five end of the gene. So again, this links back to the likelihood that the cDNA will actually be there. And finally, the most obvious thing is that your primers should bind onto the region that you're interested in and nowhere else in the genome of the organism. So they should be specific to that target. A good feature of the program I use, which is NCBI's Primer Blast, the blast part is the algorithm which takes your primer sequences and sees how likely they are to bind to other regions in that organism's genome. I'll give you an example of an output here. Say we design some primers to bind onto this gene called AFAP1, and it comes up in Primer Blast saying these primers are going to bind onto this gene, which is great. It's going to have a product length of 77 base pairs, which is brilliant. But unfortunately, underneath, what it also says is products on potentially unintended templates. So this is saying that these primers could potentially bind elsewhere, and it's coming up saying that they could bind onto this gene called FARS2, which has a product length of 2,024 base pairs. And underneath, you'll see that the, there is dots next to each primer, and the dot represents a complementary binding so you can see that the, the forward primer binds almost completely apart from that C and T base, which is different. And the reverse primer is not so similar, but still has a high likelihood that it could bind. So this is the good aspects of using NCBI's Primer Blast, which is unique to this platform. So always make sure your primers bind specifically to where you want them to. So I've given you a few examples of features of good primer pairs for qPCR.